up here. I'm not going to be able to. Oops, I'm not going to be able to see you guys once I put the PowerPoint up. So uh, let me know I'm getting through. All right. All righty. So and you might all want to go to speaker view. All righty, fellas, can you see that? Good to go. Yes, all right. We can. All righty. Good evening, fellas. My name is Rob. KD2UQK, otherwise known as the Bikini Inspector on the Morning Brew. Thank you, Mike, very, very much. Doing good tonight. I'm glad to see you guys all here. That makes me feel that makes me feel really good. I appreciate you guys, appreciate you guys being here. So a little bit of background on me just before we get started. Um, I run the P25 net on the Papa system with Dave, KC6N. He's in the audience tonight. Thank you, Dave, for showing up. And we we talk about a whole bunch of stuff from, ranging from P25 to scanners, to text, to everything. So I'm an avid scanner collector. I've got a boatload of P25 handhelds I don't know what to do with. And the, the knowledge just kind of comes from looking at the stuff, seeing how it works online, looking at different websites and generally just playing with them. So there's nothing I'm doing that you guys can't do. So let's start off with something easy. How about that? So this first picture, what do you guys see here? This is going to be an inter interactive thing. So if you guys, I, I, I'd like you guys to talk to me just so I know I'm getting out there. So what do you guys Bao see here? Fang. Bao Fang. Thank Bao you, Fang. Press. Thank you, Press. So what is, what, is the key, what is the key factor here, right? It's a Bao Fang. What is the price point? Five bucks. A ham sandwich. A ham sandwich, otherwise known as $25, right? <laughs> You got a neat little uh, eyelet there to tie a string to to your bobber so you can mark your best fish. Exactly. I think they make <laughs> even floating ones too. So they like float in the water with like keychains. All right. Now, what's this? Well, oh, that's money right there. That's money. What else is it? It's green. The guy who's wearing it has a Rolex. So he's sure, he was sure to get oh, that. Radio. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> Dave, Dave and Jeff know who I'm talking about. So, what do you think the price point is on this guy? Thomas. Three thousand dollars. Three thousand five. All right. Take a bow fang of twenty five dollars and add four thousand nine hundred and seventy five dollars to it. <laughs> that's how much these things are. Five thousand dollars, fellas. So that's what we're talking. That's the price point of the portables we're talking about. All right. So it's nineteen eighty eight. What's the main issue? Growing municipalities are looking for solutions to support more users and data transmission. Around this time, everybody is on either low band, just moving up to VHF, and they're stuck in these proprietary protocols that limit acceptance of new technologies. Customers are locked into an ecosystem that is compatible with prior gear, and there is literally no interoperability. So you, you got a whole bunch of different systems, and nobody can talk to each other. That's terrible for incident response. This year, the FCC asked for a standardized solution with more capacity and interoperability. That is the main focus of P25. So the solution, in 1989, the Association of Public Communications Officers, APCO, launched P25, aka Project 25, aka APCO 25. It's all the same thing, just a different name. So the goal was exactly what the FCC was looking for, capacity, interoperability, and a standard for everybody else going forward. So what actually is P25? It's a suite of standards for two-way radio communication systems. This is not... is conventional communication and trunked communication, right? We'll get to that. It was primarily designed for public service applications such as police and firework, but it's not limited to only voice communications. P25 is the guidelines for voice data and logistical procedures inside a compliance system. So it's not just the name of the modulation. If you hear it on, on the air, people say it's P25. Yeah, that's the name but it's also a whole set of standards and actual things inside of a system that make the system compliant. So the key guidelines in those guidelines are the common air interface, subscriber peripheral interface, and the fixed station interface. The big one is the common air interface. That's the one that lets any brand of P25 radio communicate with another brand on another brand system. So if you have a brand of portable, this is a worst case scenario, but if you have a brand of portable, a brand of trunk, of trunk system, it could be, you know, anybody, and some other guy, some other brand having the dispatch console, it might not work as well as it should, but it will all work together. So one radio using CAI should be able to communicate with any other CAI radio regardless, right? 
subscriber peripheral interface that specifies the port. So you can have MDT terminals in cars, right? You can have, it's not very prevalent because I think they're switching more to LTE now, like cellular service, but you could have all the data for your mobile ter terminals in the car going over your trunk system, which, you know, would work, but it's all right. Let me just make sure you guys, you guys hearing me okay? Or is it a little bit low? Good? Yeah, all right. Fine. Cool. So the next one is a fixed station interface. That's telephony. I should have, I should have put the graph in here. You can have auto patches, this, that, the other thing, RF subsystems. It's basically every step of the system is lined out in these guidelines. So you have a literal diagram of what's going on. You know, so that's that's the deal with that. Some more of those guidelines, we could, there's a whole bunch of them, but the big one in here is probably the ISSI interface. That means you can have two systems linked, two RF subsystems linked to another trunking actual overall infrastructure, which is a big one. It's not, it's not done too often because generally you get statewide systems or countywide systems. And then if municipalities paid for them, paid for other P25 systems, then they could patch them in. But that's a, that's a whole nother story, which I'm not going to go down. So the main manufacturers, right? Here's some eye candy. Motorola, the big one. EF Johnson, Kenwood, Harris, and Tate. Those are the biggest ones I see out there. They're just, they're just players. And they all compete with one each other, but they all work on that same common air interface, right? So who uses P25? Almost every county, almost every county has some type of P25 implementation, right? Whether it be with conventional radio to radio, in and out repeater, or a whole fancy trunk system, which you need thousands of dollars to, to be able to actually get on. Right, so different imp implementations. There's two fundamental implementations of P25, conventional or trunking. Conventional or trunking, one of the two. Conventional operation is, as I just said, basic radio to radio, in to a repeater, out through a repeater, input frequency, output frequency, none, that's it. It's still seen in rural areas that don't have big populations, like in the middle, in the middle of the country where there's like desert, nothing regular regular vhf or uhf trunking it's a totally different is the use of control channels and voice channels to cram as many people onto as little frequencies as possible and reduce spectrum usage that was the point of narrow banding back in the day right so all these all these municipalities had these 25 kilohertz wide channels and they were running out of spectrum here comes narrow banding, you slice those channels in half, and now you've got four where you just had two. And now with newer systems, they're going even smaller, they're chopping that in half, 6.25, and now you've got eight from two. So that's what these guys, that's what these guys do, and these engineers can have a whole party when they do it, I'll tell you that much. So more on implementations. The modulation scheme chosen was C4FM, pretty simple. The same as DMR, YSF, and NXDN. It has many derivative protocols like these different, different protocols, but they are not compatible with each other, obviously. You can't listen to YSF on a P25 radio, even though they're very close. You can't without some fancy stuff through, through amateur systems. Just the same as you can't listen to NXDN on DMR because it's just not the same thing, right? So... Here's the biggest thing when you're trying to listen to one of these trunk systems. Phase one or phase two. Remember that, phase one or phase two, right? What's the difference? One, two. They're different, one and two, but what's the actual difference? Here's phase one. FDMA, just like everything else, just like regular, regular old 12 and a half kilohertz channels, one conversation on one channel, second conversation on a second channel. As you can see on the bottom, frequency one, frequency two, 12 and a half kilohertz split, 12, 12 and a half kilohertz bandwidth, not split. Two conversations. Now, we'll go over to phase two, TDMA, time, division, multiple access. This is what DMR is. Two conversations on the same channel, right? 
different time slots. So combine that with what you know what we call ultra narrow banding, which is a six and a half, six point two five split. You can cram a lot more people on those channels, right? That's the whole idea. Spectrum conservation as well without compromising voice quality and getting as many people on your system. Why? More people on less channels. There you go. So where do I find out what my, what my county has? This is, this is the interactive part, guys. You go to radioreference.com and you look, right? So let's do that just for the heck of it. Just for the heck of it. Let's go. So I'm going to ask one member of the audience, what state do you live in? I don't know. Let's, I don't want to pick on anybody, but uh, I don't know. How about? Go with uh, Michigan. Michigan. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Give me a county. Washtenaw. Me... What is it called? Washtenaw. 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 Boom. Here we go. All right. So what you have here is this is the main page when you go to your county, right? You go to the data, you go to radio reference, go to databases, frequency database, click it. You're here. You're at the big map. You go in. Oh, that's where you live, Dave? That is where I live. Got to remember that. Right on that yellow block. Right on that yellow block, huh? All right. So here's what you're looking at. Different, different, uh, what should we call it? Different services. Fire EMS, police, county services, right? So what it looks like is Michigan has a statewide system. So you got Michigan's public safety communication system. You click on that guy and you get all the statistics about the, about the system. They give you notes up here, but this is the meat and potatoes that we're looking at. So here's a bunch of different sites that they have up in the system. They got a lot because, yeah, it's a statewide system. Look at this. And, and if I can inter interject here, that was a good pick because this is Dan's W2PUT state. Uh, Dan works for Motorola and there's around 150,000 P25 radios that Dan takes care of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can see. Look at look how many sites there are. This is ridiculous. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, anyway, let's just let's pick one of them. There's there's a couple of things I want you guys to keep in mind. You see this red one? That's the main control channel. Usually. If you have a scanner, that's what your scanner will sit on and listen to the system to figure out which one of the voice channels that the information is going to come out on. So you listen to that channel, you're just going to hear data. You're just going to hear constant data and it's not going to be anything different. You're going to hear it change every once in a while, right? Once your scanner hears what the system is allocating on that frequency, it will automatically shoot to any one of these voice channels and you'll hear the conversation of the talk group that you're monitoring. But the tricky part is, some sites only do certain talk groups, right? So it gets really hairy with some of these systems. Like they can do whatever the heck they want. They can put one talk group on a site. They can put 14. They can put 40. They can do the whole system. You know, it, it depends on what is going on. But the safest thing to do, in my opinion, is if you find your county, like Ottawa, Ottawa County, that's a simulcast. What's a simulcast? That's the key. That's a key word. Simulcast is essentially a big voting system in on one frequency. And it's a bunch of receivers and transmitters on the same frequency that usually in trunking environments have everything coming out of them. So Ottawa County simulcast, you click on it. It might even tell you, it gives you a bubble of what the whole county. So it's not going to tell you exactly what, where each site is. Okay, close enough. It tells you it has coverage inside that area. So what you would do in your scanner is this has 700 and 800 megahertz channels. You got to do a little bit of fishing to see what's going on. But you can be safe with putting in these four control or three control channels. And your scanner might know what the heck's going on. So that's what's happening. It's essentially the, you're, you're going in on one frequency. I think the split is 50, 50 megahertz. So you're going in on what, 803-ish? 803-575. The system does its magic and allocates you a channel on the output. And there you go. That's how, that's how a trunking system works. So then you scroll down a little bit and you find this is the big thing that gets really hairy really quick. These are all the talk groups that are on the system. 
you got to find the right the right um, the right municipality or function. And then you find the talk groups. Now, just keep in mind, fellas, don't come shooting the messenger. But if you see calls, if you keep if you see talk groups that say D E or T E, anything with an E. Unfortunately, that means it's encrypted and you're not going to be able to hear anything on it. That you're really just not going to, it's not going to happen. So fortunately for you, Dave, I'm picking on you, Dave. Go I'm ahead on. on, I can take it. I'm, pick, I'm picking on you, Dave. You don't have much encryption going on over here. Well, oh, oh, I stand corrected. These are all event channels. You know what? It's the phase one system with barely any encryption. Barely. You should be able to listen to most of the system if you put it in, which is fantastic. All right. Now, let me show you the opposite. Just, 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 from, just from experience. We'll go back up to the database. Right? Back up to the database. We click New York. We'll go to old Long Island. We go to Nassau County, which is the county next to me. These guys have a phase two system that is on all the police channels fully encrypted. So that means you're not going to get any county police channels out of the system. It's terrible, but it is how it is. But they make it nice and easy and they give you only simulcast. There's no weird site garbage going on. Only simulcast. So you, you fish around, you see which one you can hear. And you're pretty much golden. Usually it's this one, if you, so you can get these other talk groups. But the meat and potatoes is here, which unfortunately you're not going to be able to hear. All right. So, so I have these a question. systems. Question. Go ahead. I think I heard it. So when, this is Paul KV0P. So when you program a scanner for uh, or P25, I was entering all of those frequencies. So if you enter just the control channel, does the control channel tell the scanner? the frequency of the voice channels or do you have to enter all of them what kind of scanner paul well it's uh shoot um i got the radio shack one uh, i forget what okay. model it is now. and also i got the latest greatest whatever that newest one is is it an sds 100 or 200 yeah the 100 yeah. yeah that one is beautiful the sds series is beautiful because it takes it literally right from here right from radio reference it gets that on the Radio Shack one, if it functions the same way as my Whistler does, all you have to do is when you program the system, you put in just the control channels. I used to put in all the voice channels. It doesn't really make a difference. Once the, once the scanner finds which, one, which control channel you have in actually has the data going across on it, that's the one it's going to focus on and listen to every time it goes or every time the scanner goes around, right? So... so so when it when when you're receiving that data, does that data tell the scanner go to five hundred two point one three seven five? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. So it sits on here listening for when the system is going to allocate somebody coming in on the input frequencies. Once it allocates that, it it happens in less than a second. You hit the button, it goes burp, burp, whatever the sound is, and you'll be shooting off to five hundred nine nine fifty. And once that call ends, usually there's enough of a hang time where the system will allocate another channel for the recipient of that call who's answering. So you could be on 950 on one call and then end up on 500, 700 afterwards. Right. Every single time, unless the system has some hang time to it, you're gonna be on the same, you're gonna be on a different output channel every time. Now, you could be wondering if I have an old analog scanner, no, you're not gonna be able to listen to P25 systems, but let me show you another example. If you have an old, like an old 90s Motorola analog system, like a type two smart zone, you could get away with just putting in the voice channels of that system and you could hear the traffic. You're not gonna be able to follow a specific talk group. So you'll get everything dumping out on the system, but you will be able to listen to it. Just the same as if you had a P25 radio that you didn't wanna, you know, you don't wanna put on a system. You don't want to do that. It's not good and you will get in trouble. You could put only the output frequencies and you could hear the dump of the whole system. You're going to be missing calls left and right because you'll hear everything. You'll hear the buses. You'll hear the cops. You'll hear everybody. But you could do it. All right. Anybody have any questions about this? I got a little one. bit. Oh, who's got the question? Uh, Woody. Woody, um, go ahead. 
So the control channels are in red and the voice channels are in blue, right? The, yeah, the control channels are in red, red and blue. Primary, you see how it says primary control channels are in red? That's the one it's mainly on and blue are the alternate control channels. Okay, thank you. Well, it's a good question. You brought that up. I was going to mention, I totally forgot. Thank you. Red is the one it primarily sits on. Blue is the ones that it switches to every once in a while. I think they call that shuffle band plan. I, I don't really know what the point exactly is. It might just be to throw off scanners, but I don't know. Every once in a while, the control channel will become one of those blue ones. And then every other voice, every other channel, even if it's the red one, becomes a voice channel. Right. So if 8, 851, 1625 is the main control channel, all the rest of these, even the blue ones, are the voice channels. So that it kind of brings up the argument of, you know, you know how nobody really owns a frequency. It kind of brings up that argument, but because this is such a tightly allocated spectrum, nothing else is here. So they, they just kind of, they just kind of do it. And just think about it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 on just that simulcast, 13 channels, and they can fit, this system's still being built out, but they can fit many more talk groups than that on just those channels. So they are saving a boatload of spectrum just by doing that, all right? So that's the main point of these trunking systems. It's not any fancy to hide anything. You know, you can do encryption on, on conventional, you can do encryption on trunking. It doesn't make a difference. That's just their way of saving spectrum. And it's a good way for Motorola to charge more. So there you go. All right. Any more questions about that? Hey, Rob, this is Webb here in Tennessee. Go ahead, my friend. So um, if I look up my, my town here and I can see that apparently they're not encrypted, they have a mode T as in Tom. Yes. Uh, but, they, but there's no E. So with a proper scanner, I can actually pick up those frequencies. Yes. You want to tell me what town you live in? I'll look, we'll look at it right here. Yeah. Shelby County, Tennessee. Shelby County, Tennessee, Tennessee, Tennessee. Shelby County. Oops. Going too far. Shelby, Shelby County. Far left-hand corner of the state. It's where they send all the bad people. <laughs> right over there. Right. So you're looking at this, you're looking at this one or. I'm actually looking at Collierville. Begins with the C. Collier. Oh, oh, look at that. So you see this? Memphis and Shelby County, they have their own type two smart zone, old analog, but Collierville specifically has their own phase two system. Okay. So let's go into it and take a look here. All right. So they're on a 700 megahertz, assume, assumably simulcast, right? They have this, 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 this. So when you see that T, that means it is a type or a phase two talk group, which, so it's TDMA. So that is true P25 phase two. You're gonna need a, one, a more top of the line scanner to do that. The older scanners that just do phase one won't do that because it's a different, it's a, diff, it's a totally different data scheme. So do you know what kind of scanner you have? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's an old Radio Shack. Uh, Pro 20 something. It's pretty old. It's okay. old an analog. Is it, is it a brick? No, it's like a little console, you know, wood grain, very. <laughs> no, it's pretty old. Yes. Yeah. Well, that one, that one won't do it, unfortunately, but uh, it's good. It's good for, you know, if there's any other fire departments in your area, you could use it for that because a lot, a lot of fire departments haven't gone over yet. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the fire department and ambulance service. For example, you know, they, even though they're on the trunk system, they still bring that over to the old scanners that can pick it up. Unless yeah. something really bad's going down. That's, that's interesting. Okay, cool. That, that totally works. Well, you know, a good example of that is, um, you know, if you, you probably heard Collierville, Tennessee on the news about two months ago, there was a shooting at our Kroger store. Um, and once it was recognized what was going on within that, within the town, the emergency services cut off public access to those frequencies. Yeah. They didn't know if there was still an active shooter that potentially could be monitoring or, or whatever. 
Right. That's where it gets a little bit hairy because you have some departments do their dispatch channels in the clear, and then some departments do their dispatch channel, their their TAC channels encrypted, which you know is to make sense just of that. So if the guy is carrying around a scanner for some reason, he can't be like, oh, there's there's guys in the next room. So I, I see what you mean. That that's that's been a common thing. It it's mainly on the recommendation of the government that most stuff is encrypted now. It kind of stinks for us, but you know, it, you got to deal with it. Thank you. But uh, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate the question. I want to show you guys one more thing on radio reference then I'm, then I'm done yakking about it. All right. This one goes right up to Dick, right up to Dick in Buffalo. All right. This is, this is a very interesting case. So they're still on, you go to Erie County. They are on primarily analog, but they have P25 conventional, what is what it looks like. P25 conventional, still in operation. So that is non-trunked, in and out for a repeater, but P25 modulation, which, you know, makes it nice and digital. It makes it a little, I, I, they say it makes it better coverage, but that's just a digital, it, you know, that you get that digital nice line until it just drops off rather than slowly fading out. But um, that's an interesting case. There's not too many people still on conventional P25. I mean, even there, you know, there's, there's even, you know, some more services are on P25. It's in, that's interesting. There's not too much like that. But uh, all right, I'll stop yakking about radio reference. Any more questions about radio reference at all? No? All right. Hey, hey Rob. Keep... Yes. This is Paul KB0P again. So oh, I got my go scanners in front of me and I have a Radio Shack uh, Pro 96. And also I have the, that's an older one, you know, older P25. Right. And then I have the Pro 106, which is the one with the, you know, multicolor lights and everything. Yeah. And those ones, when I program those, I program them manually. I mean, I could use the program too, but I program them manually. And like I was saying earlier, I program all the frequencies in manually, all the voice channels and the control channels. So my question, I guess, just to clarify, to make sure I fully understand this, if the scanner can handle it, I could just program in the control channel without programming in the voice channels and the data from the, pro, from the um, control channel will actually basically send the receiver to that other voice frequency without me having to enter it. Is that what you were saying? Yes. I think the Pro 96 is pretty much the same thing as the Whistler 1040, is, is which what I have. It, it's a nice screen on the left, and then there's a multicolor light that you can set to different departments. Yeah. Yeah. That's the 106, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mine... If you actually, you know, that button that says tune on the right, on the right side, if you actually tune to the control channel, you'll see the data that it's getting. You'll see the Wacken ID and you'll see the, the, the NAC and you'll see whatever it's getting. So if you put in, in the actual trunk system on that scanner, if you just put in the four control, the, the, the four potential control channels, it'll find the one that it's actually broadcasting on and you won't have to put in the, the voice channels. Oh, cool. It's, it's, it's actually nice. I did my, before I figured out about computer programming, that, that scanner was the first thing I got. I sat there for a week, basically, and put in every frequency I wanted to listen to on different scan lists, and that's how, that's how I did it. So I'm, I'm right there with you, Paul. Okay, so that'll you, save a lot of time. Thank you. Yes, you should just have to put in the control channels, and you should be off to the races. Rob? Yes. Uh, do you mind if I mention something briefly of interest to all-star people? Yeah, sure. Okay, so many of us in this group have all-star notes. And it's a matter of configuration that you can broadcast your node to radio reference. A benefit to doing that is that they give you a complimentary membership, which means you can download and program your scanner from radio reference without paying any monthly fees. So, if you have a ham VoIP node, you can apply to be a feed provider, configure your node with relatively little drama, and then you will then be able to log into Radio Reference and treat yourself to all their database, and it's a nice thing. That's nice. 
that certainly is nice. I haven't, I haven't, I've only seen you do it, press. I haven't really gone into the, <laughs> gone into that kind of stuff, but I'll take your word for it. I, yeah, they, that's right. They do do the memberships if you do. Yeah, that, that that's good that you brought that up, press, because I saw that come up in the chat. Someone said, or listened to it on a radio reference stream. You could do that too. That's a great way to do it if you don't have it, but that relies on somebody else streaming it. So if that's not necessarily you, it might be delayed like a couple of minutes. It's it's a way to do it, but you can't select your own stuff, which is what I like to do. All right. So moving on, oopsies, moving on from the trunk systems, amateur P25 use. This is this is the this is the meat and potatoes of, of what we're doing. Amateur usage is only conventional phase one. No trunking, no phase two as of yet. I don't think they're ever going to do phase two because it really makes no sense. But because of this price point, because of the price point of this P25 gear, only older stuff is used. So like the XDS series um, and older Apexes, which are still ridiculous. It's like, it's like, it's a thousand dollars for the lowest of the line Apex, which is basically an XPR on steroids. It's not even, a, it's not even an, on steroids. It's like an alternative. <laughs> I digress. Pystar as with most other digital modes for amateurs, is the most widely available P25 gateway. Um, you program your radio with the talk groups you want to talk on, which is on the PiStar website. You key up, it switches. It switches, and I'll get into that in a couple of minutes. Talk groups are interpreted by the program to reflectors that are set up at specific IP addresses. So there's no brandmeister. There's no central governing. You publish the reflector. It's on an IP address on a specific port, and you're on. That's it. No central governing, governing thing, right? So some are for regions, like North America, Pacific. Others are private. As I just said, there's no mainstream entities such as Brandmeister or TGIF. Anyone can set up a reflector without having to apply for permission, which is the same as NXDN and YSF. YSF, you have to have it on the air for them to publish it, but that's not, that's not a big deal. But this is a reason why P25 is popular because you don't have to jump through a lot of hoops and you have, some guys have this commercial gear lying around. Like Henry, he's got, he's got NXDN stuff, you know, WB4IVV. He's got stuff up the kazoo and you can use it because there's an implementation for an actual reflector service that goes through the internet. So how to get on P25, there's three ways to do it. Native with a supporting radio, such as an XTS series, an Apex, cross-moding from YSF, which Dave, AB6, or I'm sorry, Jeff, AB6MB is in here. He's great at that. He's done that for a long time. It's worked fantastic for him. And Droidstar, which does everything, which is a godsend for me. Um, the popular talk groups are 10 100, 10 200, 10 400, and 31077, which is the popper reflector that me and me and Dave share doing the net on, on Tuesdays. Um, the big one, there's a load of talk groups out there, but I'll be completely honest. I don't know how active many of them are. These ones I know have some action on them, like 10, 100, 10, 200, 10, 400. And Papa Chat has stuff going on too. You just got to catch it at the right spot. So I put a link down here. I just want to show you guys. So this is the actual PyStar website of what actually populates to your hotspot. These are all the talk groups that you can dial up on P25. There's a whole boatload of them. Whole boatload. Of them. I even have one in here. Like, you know, you just post it and it's up. So all of these are active, or may be active, but you can try to connect to them. And there might be some action going on. Take a look through the list. It's at the PyStar website, P25 reflector list. That's it. Right? So just, just as a little thing, this is the last thing I'll show you. This is my collection, which was on the Facebook page. A lot of junk on this end and some half decent stuff on this end. VHF. Uh, quick question. Yeah, go ahead. The green one there, is that that $5,000 one? What, this one? Yeah, this the one color did? green one. So, <laughs> no, this one was 100 bucks I found on eBay. All so, right, thanks. this is the part that gets a lot of people. Some people spend which is okay some people spend hundreds of dollars on old gear like they'll get a brand new pristine um xts 5000 for 800 dollars. okay fine you can do that 
If you hunt through eBay, you can find good deals. Like this guy was 100. Why was it 100? One, because 800 radios are very cheap. This is an 800 radio. Notice the tiny antenna. This that I use for different for just monitoring and it just it sits around most of the time, but it varies by what band. Now here's the diff. Here's the big difference with these things old old commercial gear compared to amateur gear. Amateur gear is mostly either dual band or very biased toward one toward one band that does everything on one band or dual band, right? Like this little sad UV5R down here. It just got murdered by the rest of these. It's fine. This guy will do dual bands. These guys won't. The biggest thing you can tell is by the antenna, right? So the big one, you got a VHF one. This one's UHF high, 470 to 5, 520 something. 700, 800 UHF low, which is the guys, which is what we normally use. It's 380 to 470. That's usually that one's 900 and these days, these guys are other ones, but you got to watch it by what band it is. If you were wanting to buy one of these, you got to watch what band it is. And then you get into the flash code and then it gets a whole big thing, but uh, there's documentation on how to do that. All right. So that's all I got. I have Thanks a question for you. Much. Yeah. I and I'll open up to questions. Question. What's up? Okay. So I want to be a cool cat and I'm dating and I walk in down the aisle and I see some Motorola's. And I don't know one from the other. Yes. What, how do you begin? Like I got lucky at Dayton a couple of years ago. I found a, an XTS 3000 with a couple of batteries for 80 bucks. <laughs> and I was very fortunate to have Dan W2PUT handy to say, do I want this? You know, so I know you can't tell us everything. We can't learn everything in one session, but what do we look for? We're at the ham fest. We know we want something maybe on UHF. We ask the seller, is this UHF low split? He gives you a dumb look or he says, yes, it is. What do I need to know in terms of what I want to buy that I can start to use on Pistar, for example? Okay. So let's go back to the other, let's go back to the other thing I can show you. So generally the ones that I like to get are the full keypad ones. They're a little bit harder to find, but they, 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 they help themselves when you start using them, right? So press, you've seen, you've seen a couple of these. You've seen this one, you've seen these two, whatever. The biggest thing that you can do to verify what band it is. So I'll just, I'll just take one off the shelf right here. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it doesn't really matter. There's a tag in the back, in the back of the radio. It'll have, it will have the radio's model number on it. Generally, for UHF low, which is what most amateur activity is on, UHF low, right? So that's up to 470. That encompasses the whole ham UHF band. You're looking for an R in the fourth character of the model number. That's, that's really, without plugging into a computer and looking at the antenna, that's all you can do. Once you get it home, you can read it and you can see the flash code and then whatever you get is whatever you get or you pay to get it reflashed, which is a whole nother thing. But the biggest, the best way to tell is by the antenna on the top. They usually say what band they are, or they look a certain way. And the fourth character of the model number, that'll tell you what band it is. And you, you go from there. Then if it's in good shape, if it's not in good shape, most of these things are beat to hell because they're old public safety radios. But that's generally the best way to do it. I, and I'm looking in the chat now, Dan, thank you, Dan. You can use Google to search the model number. Very simple, very easy. You can even look up the flash code that's on the, on the sticker. They come with the stock flash code. Most of the time they're wrong because they get reflashed and whatever. But that's generally, that's generally the easiest way to tell. What do you mean by flash code? Is that firmware version or something? Yeah, this is a whole, a whole nother can of work. Flash code is the feature set that's on the radio currently. So you can have a flash code. It, it's, it, it's, it's a number. It's a computer generated number that, that corresponds to certain bits. So you can have these features enabled and it, it means a different flash code. So the biggest thing I find amateurs look for is FPP. We take it for granted in amateur radios because you can just dial up a frequency. You can put an offset. You can put a tone. You're done. On these commercial radios, which is why I like the Model 3s, with the keypad, 
is with FPP, you can dial in your own TX, RX, tones, what modulation type, the bandwidth, and I think one other thing. That's dependent on the flash code. That was an old, you know, believe it or not, FPP was an old federal government only thing. But since people have learned how to jailbreak these things, essentially, there's a ton of them floating out there with guys with dealer software, just type in a flash code and boom, it goes on the radio. We as amateurs, unless you have access to the stuff, can't do that. You're just mainly stuck with what you got. But there's some guys you can pay out there to reflash them and you can get whatever you want. As Dan said, online, there's flash code encoders and decoders. Encoders and decoders. So if I look at a radio and it says the flash code, um, it says, man, it's this one says manufactured code, but it's the same thing. It gives you a decimal number. You plug that in and it tells you what features the radio has. Most of those features are pretty useless for amateurs. Most of them. But there's a couple that make a difference to some people and power to you if it does. Does that kind of answer your question in a long roundabout way, Press? Yeah, what's an example of features that are not useful and are useful for amateurs? Oh, we're going. We're going. We're taking a look. No, we're going. We're going. All right. So we'll go to Arkham.net, Flash Code. This is the one I use. It'll give you a bunch of different radios that have the Flash Code system. So it goes back to the MTS and MC MCX series. All right. So what I just had in my hand was a 5000 Model 1. We'll go to XS5000. You don't put anything in, it should. Oh, I'm sorry, you gotta go to the encoder. <laughs> sorry. All right, so XTS5000, select platform. This is the entire feature set that you could order from Motorola when these radios were new, right? So most of these, the big ones you want, in my, in my opinion, Astro IBM E Digital, that means you can do, P, you, you, that means you could do digital operation, aka P25. Enhanced digital ID tells you a unit number. This is the big one, federal government FPP. That was the option that let you dial up the frequencies from the front. Hardware multi-key, if you're not using it in a commercial application, that means nothing. OTAR means nothing for amateurs. Trunk radio trace, nothing. Status message. See another one, 12 and a half kilohertz. So it's locked to 12 and a half kilohertz over most of this stuff. I could go through this whole list, but most of this stuff is only useful in a dispatch environment. So th does that answer your question, Press? Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. So that's every option you can get for an XTS series. Now it varies wildly depending on which one you get, right? So an Astro Saber has some more, has some completely different feature set it's, it's got MODAT, for God's sake. Who uses MODAT anymore? They did back when they were new, right? So it goes with what era. You can get some of these radios for stupidly cheap, but if you don't know what they have, I, I generally stay away from them. I like to know what flash code is on them, what obviously what band it is, and how, in, how good a shape it is. If it's a piece of junk, but it's got a good flash code, yeah, all right, maybe if it's cheap enough. But... You know, there's always a cheaper one out there. That's that's the big thing. All right. Any other questions? You got one in chat. Uh... Oh, I got one in chat. Ooh, let me see. Okay, so we got a couple of stands saying soft ID. Yeah, soft ID is a nice one. That's that's part of the common. That's part of the interface. Actually, no, is it part of the common narrative interface? I don't think so. Basically, what it does is if you key up, you can see an alias that's given through the radio signal to the other radio. So it doesn't depend on what the call is on the, on the other radio that's receiving. It sends a name along with it. It works through PyStar, which me and me, Dave and Jeff have all gone along with, but uh, yes, soft ID is a very good one. So Nick says- Rob, Rob can you talk about uh, P25NX network versus Brandmeister? Yes. Yes, let me just get to one point in the chat then I'll get back, to, then I'll do that. So Nick says, keep in mind, you cannot have all of these options. True. Not all of these options are compatible with each other. Like trunking and FPP don't work together. Sometimes I have one. I got screwed on one radio. Sometimes they put them both in there. And then it doesn't, it, it's like a corrupt flash code and it doesn't work. I got burned on one radio like that. 
It depends on your firmware version. It depends. Uh, yes. Motorola version firmware nine and below can have the two, but after firmware version nine, they will not work together. You'll brick your radio. Is that only on XTSs? Yeah, for the XTS yeah. series. Uh, XTS, the Astro 25, not the 3000, because the 3000s and the 5000s, there's a difference between Astro and Astro 25 radios. Yes. Apps, yes, that's that's a big difference. The old Astro radios are the 3000 and Sabres, and then you get the... Uh... Yeah, 3000 Sabres are the same line, different CPS, different programming cable, and then 1500s, 2500s, and 5000s are Astro 25 line, and then the next one up is the APX. Yes, yes, that's that's absolutely true. So here's the radio in question I got burned on. So it works, it's just... <laughs> it's a VH, I'm not going to use VHF trunking. What? Why is it on here? Whatever, anyway... Anyway, all right, on to P25NX. I believe P25NX is a little bit closer to defunct at this point because I remember at a certain point a while ago, they had P25NX, which is a linking of actual Quantars, Quantar systems. They could be voting systems. They could be a single repeater. They were hacking up Cisco routers and making a network of these things. That was a real, a real system, the real P25 network system. It was great. The audio quality was fantastic. But then when PyStar came out, they linked it to PyStar. I think it was via DB switch. And these guys said their traffic was diluted with, with people who didn't know what they were talking about. I don't know. I never really frequented 10, 200 too much, but hey, to each their own, right? So no, are you aware of any um, interfaces that work with the Quantars on the uh, the new Brandmeister? What, what's the new Brandmeister? Well, Brandmeister being newer than P25NX. P25NX was around before Brandmeister even came out. Well, the thing is, you can't. there is no such thing as Brandmeister for P25. There's just the Pi-Star Pi -Star list of reflectors. Right, the listing, right. Yes. So there is no real central governing besides for that, which just populates the list on your actual thing. So I've seen guys implement MMDVM somehow. Maybe they tap the discriminator. I, I don't really know. That, that's not really my area of expertise. I don't really know. They put MMDVMs on these things, and then it becomes a pi star entity. Right? So you're functioning off of that reflector list on the PyStar website. So you could link to any one of these through your Quantar. I don't know how those guys are doing it, but all I know is I don't think the P25NX system is as big as it used to be. All right, does that answer your question? Yes, yes it does. All right, anybody else? All right, fellas, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. It's a pleasure coming around, and I hope I answered some questions for you guys. Look at that. Look at the timer. An hour on the dot, baby. How's that? Is that good?